All right, well, thank you. Um, so we're here to talk uh, about the tax bill, uh, but also to talk a little bit about what the tax bill is uh, and this entire Republican budget is gonna mean for uh, Minnesota families. Uh, I know Representative Davids is a fan of Journey. Uh, I think the song for this tax bill is Separate Ways, Worlds Apart, uh, because that's what this bill does with, with where uh, this bill stands versus where the governor and the Senate are. And I think uh, it truly is worlds apart from what Minnesota families need. Uh, I am joined today by Minnesotans who are going to be left behind by the choices that Republicans made, uh, have made in putting uh, businesses and corporations ahead of uh, our kids, ahead of working families, and ahead of greater Minnesota. Despite a $2 billion budget surplus, the Republican budget plan is going to have real consequences for Minnesotans, and you'll hear about some of those consequences uh, from the Minnesotans who are joining me today. Uh, teachers are going to be laid off and kids are going to have fewer opportunities. Working Minnesotans will lose access to affordable health care coverage. Hardworking servers will have their wages cut. And while these Minnesotans are left behind, and remember, these are choices the Republicans are making. If you sat in on any of the committee hearings, you will have heard chairs and Republican members wringing their hands over the fact that they have no choice but to pass the budgets for higher ed or for health care or for education because they were forced to by their targets. The fact is those targets were a choice that the Republicans are making. And they were ch the choice they were made because of the tax bill that they talked about earlier today. So do not let people get away with trying to point their fingers and avert blame for this because the responsibility for the consequences of their budget lie with them. Um, you know, Republicans desperately want to talk about this tax bill uh, in, a way, uh, in, a way, in this way. They want to talk about this tax bill as a way to provide middle class families with tax relief. But the dirty secret of this tax bill is that the biggest tax cut in this bill is permanent, multi-billion dollar giveaway to the largest corporations in, and businesses in Minnesota. There's no two ways about it. The massive tax giveaway is what's gonna shortchange our kids and Minnesota's future. And this bill guarantees, it guarantees that Minnesotans will be back facing budget deficits and painful budget cuts in the near future. If everything that's in this bill were phased in this year, you would see a $2 billion budget uh, deficit showing up this year. That's the, that's the scale of, of, the, uh, of the budget deficits we're going to be facing if this bill is passed. So with a $2 billion budget surplus, we could be doing so much better for Minnesota. We could be investing in our kids. Uh, we could be providing some middle class tax cuts, uh, but we could also choose our kids instead of laying off teachers. Uh, we could be making child care more affordable for families instead of throwing Minnesotans off their health care. Uh, we could do all these things while keeping our budget in balance in the future. And with that, uh, I want to turn it over to some of the Minnesotans who are going to be able to describe the choice that the Republicans are making with this tax bill and with their overall budget. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeannie Scar, uh, who is uh, an adapted physical education teacher at Centennial Middle School. Good morning. My name is Jeannie Scar. I'm a teacher at the middle school in the Centennial School District. I'm here to speak on behalf of nearly 450 teachers who are now in school struggling to find enough time to spend with each student in their classrooms while hoping that each has had enough to eat and all have had the care that they need at home. One of the hardest things about being an educator is accepting how deeply our schools and students are impacted by decisions made by our elected officials. Legislators at the Capitol are debating whether they're going to increase school funding at the rate of inflation or whether they're going to ask educators, schools, and our students to continue to do more with less. This is in the context of an almost $2 billion surplus. At Centennial, funding that does not at least keep pace to inflation will force class sizes beyond limits which in turn will irrevocably damage our students' chances to learn and will put their safety and well-being at risk. In my setting, I've seen a drastic increase in the number of students with significant needs. Requiring the attention of many professionals, I've had to involve administrators, other teachers, and even law enforcement in order to protect students from themselves and of course to ensure the safety of all. Increases in testing and paperwork leave almost no time to teach, 
and less time to develop the positive relationships that lead to true, deep, and lasting learning. This budget proposed by the House majority would significantly impact my district and my students. Choices between what's best, what's right, what's safe will be second, third, and fourth. We've got an almost $2 billion surplus. If we're not going to put our children first now, when will we? Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, the next uh, person is Les uh, Leslie Hodson. She's a Minnesota care enrollee from Fountain, Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, my name is Leslie Hodson. I'm from Fountain, Minnesota. That's the southeast part of the state. That's Representative David's district. Um, I, um, my husband and I, we farm, and we have a small business on our farm also where we build and install custom cabinets. We occasionally employ people uh, since the economic downturn. Now we haven't been able to employ anybody, but uh, we are a small business and we're self-employed. We had been struggling with the ever rising cost of health care premiums and employer based health care options and then lastly the ever rising deductible on our policy until we got to the point where it was such a bad value and we have to use our money wisely that we basically stopped buying health insurance a few years ago and thought we would just we were reasonably healthy and we would just pay for our own doctor bills and hope that nothing over $15,000 happened. So we went for three or four years without it and then through the good fortune of being a member of the Land Stewardship Project, um, I got on the health care committee to, to work on these issues with Paul Sobosinski and then I was introduced to this Minnesota Care Program that's been around for 20 years and, and farmers and rural Minnesotans and, and self-employed people have been using it for 20 years. It's a, it's a wonderful program and it's been a blessing to us to have health care that we can afford the premium on and uh, it doesn't have a deductible to the extent that we'll be faced with monthly bills of, of two, three hundred dollars on top of our premiums. So it's, it's made a huge change in our life to be able to have our businesses be able to keep some of our money and also have health insurance and, and, and feel good going forward with things. And I really, really hope that in this period of all this transition in the healthcare systems and all the ways that people are paying for insurance, I really hope they don't destroy Minnesota Care at least for a while until they get a good look at it. I think it's a really good program and they could work on it and make it even better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next uh, speaker is Nancy Swanson. Uh, she is a server at the Green Mill in Wilmer, Minnesota. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Nancy Swanson, and I'm addressing the issue of uh, abolishing the minimum wage for servers. My husband and I have four children, and I began working at the Green Mill 15 years ago when our youngest was just eight months old. And um, it was an awesome way that I could be able to be home with my little ones and also help to supplement our family's income. Um, I've always felt like I've done uh, above and beyond to do my best to be the very best possible server that I can be. And as a result, um, you know, people are generous and they give nice tips. And I think that um, to take that hard earned reward and then have it deducted from my paycheck is really ridiculous. And I just, I, I think it's basically saying that I'm going to be punished for a job well done. And so I, I really think it's important for all of our legislators to take a step back and really take a wider view at what's being proposed and, 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 and see what kind of effect it's going to have on families a lot of single moms that are you know, raising children on their own, a lot of college students that are trying not to be buried in debt um, by having a server job, and, and just ask themselves, is this really going to be good for Minnesota, for families, and really for our entire economy? Thank you. And as I'm sure all of you know, the, um, 
the tip penalty bill is one of the many, many items in Representative Garofalo's uh, jobs uh, bill. Uh, the next speaker we have is Anna Angelis Ferris, uh, who is a custodian uh, at the, the, in the Lakeville School District. Hello, my name is Anna. I'm a custodian of the Lakeville School District. I'm a mother, a grandmother, and a school's staff. I've had a front row seat for the good and the bad of our state's education funding. For the last decade, our legislators preserved tax loopholes on the backs of our children. Two years ago, Governor Dayton and the DFL-controlled legislative session finally paid back our kids and started making real investments in education that they needed to ensure that our students, who by the way are our future, have the, a fair chance to succeed. This is all being threatened because now we hear the House Republicans are doubling down on their past mistakes by working to give handouts to the rich while funding school levels that will cause more cuts. Thereby harming students, especially those in the greater Minnesota. Cutting education to fund tax cuts for Minnesota's richest is wrong. Any way you look at it, it's wrong. As a concerned Minnesota citizen, a parent, and a grandparent, and school staff member, I call on our elected officials to invest in education, not tax breaks for our richest in our state. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. The um, last uh, person we have is Monica Haas and her kids uh, from St. Paul, Minnesota. Hi, my name is Monica Haas. I'm a mother of four little girls here in St. Paul. Um, I have Violet, who's 16, Eleanor, who's nine, Beatrix, who's seven, and Rosie is uh, in her French test. She's going to be 15 soon, so she couldn't skip today. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit about pre-K and ECFE because my family has benefited so much from those programs. All four of my girls went through um, ECFE and um, pre-K through the St. Paul Public School System, and my family is so much better for it. My kids were ready to learn. They came out of pre-K being able to read words, and every student in Minnesota should have that ability when they are four years old. And every family should have the ability to participate in ECFE. It makes a world of difference to the families themselves, not just the children, but the families in Minnesota. I can't stress how hard it was to hear yesterday that one of my favorite pre-K teachers of this one and this one lost her job. She got cut because they just don't have the funding for it. One of the best teachers I've ever come across. So I just wanna say that that is important to these kids. These kids are your future. This is who's gonna raise you, who's gonna take care of you in your nursing home. They are your doctors, they're your architects, they're your engineers. This is who you need to invest your money in. This is where it should go. So, well, thank you to everybody. Um, just a couple of other points. Um, so the Republicans did talk a lot about their middle class tax cuts, but I just wanna dwell on that a little bit. First, uh, as you've heard today, uh, their overall budget bills are hurting mid middle class Minnesotans, laying off teachers, cutting health care for working families, for farmers, for small business people, reducing wages, uh, raising tuition. All of these directly impact middle class Minnesotans' pockets books. Uh, and so I think that's important to remember as we talk about this budget that's moving forward in this tax bill. Secondly, uh, the premier tax cut uh, in this bill is nothing more than a David's deception. Uh, the exemption that purportedly benefits every, every Minnesotan, uh, for a person uh, at 50, making $50,000 a year, that person is gonna see about $70 reduction in their tax bill uh, for two years. One, you know, $70 for two years. Uh, that's about $1.40 a week, less than a cup of coffee a week. Uh, that is gonna result from this. They like to talk about it as a $1,000 exemption, but let's be very clear, uh, it's about $70 a year for that person, and not much more, you know, and, and for per someone making $40,000, $38,000 is about $50 a year. Uh, so let, we have to be very clear about that. Um, 
what Representative Davids is doing by holding up that shiny object uh, is, is trying to disguise the fact that there are huge business and corporate tax breaks in this bill. Uh, if this bill, if the CI tax breaks that were, uh, are going to be phased in were put in immediately today, we'd be at a $2 billion tax cut for corporations. And over the next eight years, corporations are going to be getting about $5 billion in tax cuts as a result of this. So people are getting about $50 to $70 a year, while behind them, in the back room, the Republicans are shoveling $5 billion of tax cuts to businesses, and these are not just small businesses. The biggest beneficiaries of this when it's fully phased in are gonna be Sid Dermazian, it's gonna be Home Depot, it's gonna be Walmart. These are the people that own huge amounts of property in the state of Minnesota, CI property in the state of Minnesota. So let's not, so let's not let David's deception fool Minnesotans. Uh, it is the wrong way to go. They're trying to trick Minnesotans just as they are with all the shifts and gimmicks they're putting into their budgets. This is just another deception for Minnesotans. And, there is no doubt that the billions of dollars in business and corporate tax cuts that are in this bill, and will, as it's permanently phased in, uh, are gonna take us into a deficit. There will be more budget cuts, there will be more deficits, there's gonna be more bad budgeting on the horizon as a result of what the Republicans are proposing today. So please, Minnesotans, don't fall for this David's deception. Uh, this bill might look like an okay deal uh, in the short term, and it even isn't an okay deal in the short term based on what you heard today, what it means for education and healthcare and higher education. Minnesotans for our kids and for Minnesota's future. If people have questions. No, the person making $50,000 is gonna get about $70. That's, you know, and then you spread that over Minnesotans, you know, it adds up to their number. But again, remember, this is two years, and then it goes away. This is essentially a Jesse check that the Republicans are promising to, to Minnesotans, something that Kurt Doubt said they absolutely wouldn't do. But that's what this is. It's just you won't see the check being sent to you. Uh, but that, that's who's benefiting uh, from this. I mean, they, it's, it's, it's $50 to $70 for a single filer, and that's and that's that's it. Would they have been better off? They'd have been better off investing that money in education. They'd be better off investing that money, uh, making sure people have access to health care. They'd be better off investing that money, making sure our hospitals are sustainable. They'd be better off investing that money to make sure that tuitions aren't going up and students and families aren't continuing to accumulate a lot of debt, which is going to be the consequence of the Republican spending bills. They, they will say that everything you folks are trying to do is to spend more money and not return money to Minnesotans. Now, you may not agree with the way that they're returning it to Minnesotans in this bill, but how do you respond to their their statement that you just want to spend it and you don't want to return any of it or, or a lot less than what they want to return? Well, I think there is a place for some middle class uh, tax relief, and we've said that the whole time. Uh, I think what the governor's proposing with his child care tax credit is something that we could we could focus in on. It would be solving a, and helping solve a real middle class family's problems. But just sending randomly $50 to a, an individual is not going to accomplish that. Is there anything in this House GOP proposal that you could embrace? Sure, I think that there's going to be, and, and I have to go through and, and look at it, but I think, you know, the chi I think the child care tax credit is in this proposal. That's something that we, you know, I think we can embrace. I think there's some long-term care tax credits in this proposal, probably something, although I don't know how effective they are, uh, something that we can embrace. So there absolutely will be. But if you look at the, at the end of the day, from my perspective, and instead of digging into the details, if you look at this bill, it is a huge giveaway to businesses and corporations, and middle-class Minnesotans are not getting the benefit that the Republicans are telling them they're getting. Because they, they say the opposite. They say 75 percent of it will flow to middle-class taxpayers. Uh, how do you see that so differently? Because what they're doing is trying to deceive the people in Minnesota. So they're giving this one-time $589 million, you know, $50 tax cut to Minnesotans but they're phasing in this huge corporate tax cut, the CI tax cut, that over five years is gonna be, or over eight years is gonna be five billion dollars. So in the short term, if you just look at the next two years, you know, maybe it looks, it looks more proportional than it really is, but if you look at, at it over the long term and what they've hidden and built into this bill, it's clearly a huge tax giveaway to big corporations and middle class Minnesotans will not see the benefit and they're also gonna be impacted by the consequences of those decisions, which is layoff of teachers and larger class sizes and higher tuitions and being thrown off uh, healthcare. What about Social Security tax phase out for seniors? Could you get behind that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that there will be members of our caucus that will be, that will be open to that. Again, though, I would point out that's a billion dollars a year when we get out into the out years uh, that someone needs to figure out a way to pay for uh, or, or present what kind of cuts they're going to make to pay for it in the future. Representative, you keep mentioning that these tax cuts are unsustainable, but isn't government spending under uh, Governor Dayton's budget or the Senate Democrats' budget also going to cause problems over the long term in terms of sustainability? I mean, it's not one or you can't say, well, it's one, it's both, isn't it? It's, well, I think that we have to watch that very carefully. I don't doubt that. But if you look at the way that this tax bill is phased in, you go from $400 million in one year to $2 billion, $2.1 billion in a couple of years for one provision of this tax bill. The there may be issues around it. Paul, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah. The phase in. The phase in. So, I mean, it, it ramps up so significantly that there's guaranteed that we're going to have budget deficits under the Republican proposal. I don't know that the, the spending, in particularly in the Senate or in the governor's bill, ramps up at that, at that rate. Representative Marshall, can we ask you about the urban rural? I mean, you see the images there. You see farmers. You see seniors. I actually didn't know the balance between rural and metro, but they're going after Minneapolis, taking away some of their tax relief. Do you feel like this is geographically they're aiming for your area? Well, they might be aiming for it, but they've missed by quite a, quite a bit. You know, you take, for example, the local government aid cuts that they have, $84 million. Now, about $20 million of that's a greater Minnesota, but in the long term, and, and that's what uh, Leader Thiessen's talking about, it's the long term, and when you hurt the viability of that program, you threaten the entire local government aid program. Let's just take the commercial, industrial, cuts when those are fully phased in, uh, over 70% of that $2 billion, each biennium, goes to the metro, 70%. And that's a huge portion of the bill. So uh, I think, again, uh, the rhetoric has been one thing uh, by the Republicans, but when you look at their actions and what they're doing, it's totally something different. Well, and maybe Resident Marker can talk a little bit about this, but the bottom line is the way that the Republicans are doing that spending is much less efficient than actually spending the money. So for instance, the tuition tax credit. When you get that tax credit, you're sending 15, 30, 38 percent of that money to the federal government, because when you reduce your state taxes, you increase your federal taxes, since state taxes are a deduction on your federal tax form. So when that gets reduced, you're, so if it gets reduced by $100 and you're in a 30% tax bracket, $30 of that reduction is going right to President Obama, which I'm surprised that the Republicans would want to do, but it's going right to the federal government. Um, as opposed to if we were to put that money into the University of Minnesota, which as everybody knows, well now it's going to maybe get a little bit of money, but it's going to get essentially $0. If you put that money into the University of Minnesota, 100% of that money would go to hold down tuition or, or do what have you. And that's true of essentially every piece of their tax cut proposal uh, going forward. It's just a much less efficient way uh, of accomplishing the ends, I think, that uh, we want to accomplish. Speaking of that, our, our new leader, Thiessen, the, uh, a lot of the narrative in the Republican press releases about their education bill, the higher ed bill, their, uh, the health, health and human services bill, says that they're focusing their limited resources on those who need it the most. That, that, uh, that as you know, they're, they're doing more targeted preschool rather than universal preschool, things like that. Yeah, how do you respond to that? Well, I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think that a focus on those who need it most is okay, but the bottom line is they don't have the resources to even focus on those who need it most. I mean, if you look at their education bill, uh, it's less than a 1% increase, as opposed to the, you know, it's a buck for every $15 they're doing in the tax bill that they propose today. Uh, less than a 1% increase, uh, six tenths on the formula, and a little bit of money into early childhood. Uh, it's not just, it's everybody that's going to be left behind, the ones they say they want to focus on and, the, and everybody else. Uh, so uh, if they really want to focus on, if they really want to have that discussion, we can have that discussion. But the bills that they're putting forward uh, are hurting everybody. Elaborate a little bit more on, on the premiums you paid before we had insurance. The premiums are going down. It's going to give them what Minnesota Care does in family. 
Well, what we've been doing is we have a farm, we have livestock, and livestock, in my opinion, require care and attention, and um, we graze. It's somewhat labor-intensive way to raise cattle, but we keep them out on the grass. And uh, so what my husband and I had been doing was taking turns getting a job where one of us could get half of our health insurance paid for. We never reached the point where we could afford both of us to get health insurance. So we sort of traded off which one of us was covered for a few years at a time. Um, the, last, the last job that he was at, uh, it would be 750 for the two of us to have health insurance. I'm just over 50, he's not 50 yet. Um, it would have been 750 and I don't remember the deductible, but the deductible that we stopped buying insurance at was uh, raised by the insurer up to $6,000. And I didn't realize they could do that. And uh, so the deductible was 600 and it was close to 400 for one person's premium. There's no way that we could do two people and be faced with the, the bill that you get when you have a $6,000 deductible. You, you never clean up your deductible in a year. You just constantly have a, a bill on top of your premium. So maybe you'll be, you know, eight, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 a month at some point in time for two people. And what is it on an assessment? What are you paying on an assessment? We're around $100 a month. And I don't know completely what the deductible scenario is, but it's much lower than $6,000. And to that point, I mean, the, uh, the Republicans, you know, in Minnesota care now, they're spending, what, about half a, we're, we're covering people for about half a billion dollars a year, roughly. They're gonna put about $50 million a year in to cover the difference in those premiums and deductibles. So that can give you a sense of the proportionality here that we're talking about in terms of whether we're going to have affordable health care for people like Leslie or not. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you for coming. Great. Did you have fun? Hopefully, it'll be on TV now, right? You have to watch. Thank you so much. 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 Thank you so much.